<laughs> well, you know, they say one of the best ways to learn something is to teach it. So, um, probably a good experience to go through identifying uncertainties. What about with Andy Harris? Right. I've learned that. I've learned that too. So you might get a lot out of the experience. <laughs> Sets and you can present it in charts, you can present it in tables, you can do ad hoc, ad hoc queries, you can have an output to a database with, with uh, code. Today we're going to be focused on UI control, so user interface control, so you can place on model to control the model, control the assumptions of the model. So we'll see how this is done in any logic. Um, we'll then go on to uh, have a brief look at a couple issues in Java that I've to but not particularly explained and we're going to um, uh, we're going to finish with some discussion of calibration so calibration uh, the process of matching a model and model to uh, historic data for example in light that in a way that takes into account the uncertainties associated with stochastics and so first we're going to start talking about user controls. Um, so the term control is used within computer science to refer to little devices or widgets as it were, software widgets, that allow for obtaining user input, for interacting with the user. And these widgets have properties that can be set at design time and, and also so when you're building the model they have a representation that you can, where you can set properties of them. And then when you run the model, you can interact with them as well, both through calls to them and, and visually. Um, and uh, we can set properties to these controls during call, building up the model to establish their logic, sort of what they look like visually, and to establish some correspondence between the widget on the one hand and model variables. So a logical correspondence having to do with when you change the widget, how does it change the model? And uh, these controls can be used by the user during simulation to set assumptions. So we're going to um, take a look at how controls can be applied to two different models. And in the process, I'm going to introduce some concepts um, that I really haven't uh, talked much about, but have to do with um, uh, with using additional libraries from Java to support the models. In other words, going beyond what's supported in any logic and using a broader set of functionality that's available out there um, for Java programs. Okay, um, so we'll see that uh, see that in this lecture as well. So I'd like you to load in for for the exercise we're going to be walking through here. I'd like you to load in. We had built up a model called Minimalist SIR Network uh, ABM. This was a, a model we built many lectures ago now, which involved a network and there was an SIR type uh, logic associated, susceptible, infected, recovered, whereby infection was spreading across the network. And uh, once you load it in, I'd suggest saving it as under a different name, like UI supported Minimalist Network ABM. But if you want to 
to just change it directly, that's up to you. Okay. Um, so we're going to be adding UI support. For we're going to basically have a UI to tweak some aspects of the model, uh, both in its initial assumptions and how it's running over time. And um, in the process, we'll, we'll kind of see how widget, these widgets, these so-called controls work. So you'll recall that in this model, there's a hard-coded um, uh, exposure rate. So this may take you back some time, and I wouldn't expect you to remember it off the top of your head. But if you go to the person component within the model, um, what you'll notice is that um, this is person here. And this transition here, which represents sending exposure messages to random people nearby, has a rate associated with it, a rate of 0 0.5. And we're going to set this model up so that this, the assumption about this rate can be modified. Okay. Uh, so first of all, I'd like you to add a parameter. And this is just good practice. Add a parameter that's called something like exposure hazard. Um, technically, at a technical level, it goes by the name of a hazard. It's a certain chance per unit time that uh, this person will expose someone. Um, but you could call it ex exposure, you know, likelihood per month or what have you. And it has a default value of 0.5, and it's a double. It's a double precision value. Okay. So we're adding a parameter from over there under general. Um, and we're going to have the transition instead of being hard-coded, as it was here, with this 0.5, it's going to use the parameter. Okay? And that's going to be the first step in having that assumption be modifiable by the user when they run the model. So it's going to be 0.5. Um, and, um, oh, I forgot to emphasize, excuse me. Yeah, I should have emphasized it here, but um, that exposure hazard parameter is going to live in Maine. <laughs> Not in Fred Bangor. Um, uh, so it's going to live in Maine rather than person. So if you put it in person, um, I'd like you to, you can cut control X and then you can go up to Maine and paste it. Control V and just move it over there. Alternatively, you could probably drag it from one to the other visually. Um, the point is it needs to live in, in Maine. And the, the reason for this will be obvious. Now, at a conceptual level, it's associated with a person. So um, uh, there's some, some uh, reason to, to question about whether uh, it should indeed live in Maine or in a person. I'm not going to go into that now. It's true that you might quibble with, it, with this choice. But for now, it's going to live in Maine. So exposure hazard is going to be an assumption. It's going to be associated with the Maine class. Okay. And what I'd like you to do is to go back to person, and for this transition in person, for the rate for that, instead of being 0.5, as it used to be, we're going to make it refer instead to this exposure hazard, which lives in Maine. So you're going to have to, instead of 0 0.5 here, you're going to have to have this dot get main dot exposure hazard. Okay? So, um... In short, the rate is going to be going from a hard-coded quantity, 0 0.5, to instead of an expression here, which gets the appropriate value. And it has to, to get it. This is referring to whom? Who, to whom does this refer? We're in person. So it's referring to the current what? Yeah, the current agent, the current person. Requesting a reference to their main class, to the main object. Um, instance of that class. And with that reference, we can ask for what's the exposure hazard associated with that. Okay? So here we, we're sort of having main hold this parameter, and we're just getting its value here. So that's associated with uh, this, this rate. Okay? Um, so this is, this is what you should have. Um, this dot get main dot exposure hazard. So to have that rate, it's going to go to main. Okay. Now, there's another thing I'd like you to look at, which is up in Maine, um, down Maine, there's a uh, population, and again, that should have the hazard here. I don't know why it's not, not shown. It should, it should be shown. Um, uh, there, what I'd like you to do is, uh, you'll notice that there's a uh, number
number of, of objects specified, so number of people in that population. And I'd instead like you to create a parameter called population size. Okay? That parameter population size should have a default value of 100. And then the population is going to be of size, population size, instead of being of size 100. So this is, as we say, parameterizing the model. It's allowing us to change the assumptions about what the population size here is. Previously, this was hard-coded, so to speak. The population had a size 100, and there wasn't much we could do about it you know, while we're running the model. We can't change that. Um, we are going to, because we're adding this parameter, population size, now we can, we can uh, change that so we have an initial number of objects, population. So we're, we're changing it so the population size is given by this parameter. Remember, that 100 and this putting a population size here, these are just expressions. They evaluate to a value for the initial number of objects. And in both cases, the defaults will be 100 um, because that's the default value of the parameter. But because it's a parameter, we can vary it. And that's what we're going to be doing. So any questions on this? going through this, um, the slide's pretty quick, and people may have, want me to go back to an earlier slide. Does that make sense? So we're creating two parameters, both in main. One is population size, one is uh, exposure hazard. Okay. Um, okay, so if you go to the simulation now, if you go to the simulation associated with this model, the one experiment we have. And you go look at it, in the general tab, there should be a statement of the assumptions for this particular experiment, what population size you want to use and what exposure hazard you want to use. Why do we have this? Why, why are these things here? How does it know to put these here? Where do those come from? From Maine, and what about Maine? These like what sort of information does it list there? Things that are what inside of Maine? These are parameters. parameters. These are just all the parameters. And in fact, if you went to parameters here, there's another list of them. Those are just the parameters associated with the corresponding main active object class, this thing up here. So if you try something else, it would be a different set of parameters. Here we're choosing main, so it just lists the parameters. Remember, parameters are the conduit by which the thing that creates the object can tell the object what properties to have. Here, this thing is going to be creating the main object, which is going to, then going to serve as the stage on which the agents will circulate. And here we're going to be telling it what population size to assume and what exposure has it to assume. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to run that experiment. Um, so if you run it, um, you should see something along the so you should, you should see 100 people spread out over space. One of them gets initially infected. And unless the person who got infected initially is, is uh, you know, a singleton, it'll start to, start to spread, okay? something along those lines. So no difference from before. All we've done is we've generalized it. We've taken information that was hard-coded previously, and we've parameterized it by that information so we could change those assumptions. Okay, now what we're going to be doing is using that with controls. Okay, we're going to be using the flexibility of using, having the parameters to associate controls with this model. Now one thing I want to break down though is, is something we've been glossing over before. So if you go to simulation, if you go to the experiment and you go click on the button you may have wondered why that button is there when you run the model, but you kind of took it for granted. Well, what is that button actually doing? Well, you can see if you click on the button, there's actually some information about the button. One thing is it says, okay, under what condition is it enabled? Under what condition can you press that button? Is it pressable? And second of all, when you press it, what does it do? What, what's undertaken? You see here, it somehow tells it to run, and it somehow tells it to display what's on the screen associated with the kind of main class. So it basically says, 
hey, go present what the, the presentation associated with the main class. That's kind of what that's doing. Um, the run is the key thing that it's actually running the model and then it's visualizing it. So what we're going to do is start adding components like buttons, like sliders, like checkboxes to this. So we can see how to build up a user interface. We can see how to build up elements for the user to control visually to change the assumptions. Okay, so um, the button is just the first of them. That, that's kind of put there automatically. But my point is that that's just one of many controls. And so if you go over to the palette over here on the right hand side, you'll notice that um, there's a, uh, a set of um, a set of controls here. Um, you can you can see them along here under the control tab, and um, you'll notice there is a button, a checkbox, edit box, radio button, sliders. Now some of these ones towards the end are only available in professional edition, so we're not going to be using all of them, but we're going to be using um, a couple of them uh, in showing how you can how you can make them work to good effect. Um, so I'd like you first to drag from a slider, that's the fifth one down over here. I'd like you to drag that onto the, to the screen there, onto the, the canvas, okay? Um, yeah. Oh, um, no, I did not post them, thanks. Oh, okay, um, right. Uh, yeah, um, might be able to post them during a, a break or something like that, but uh, apologies for that. Um, okay, so um, slider, what you see is when you drag the slider over, th this is a bunch of set things that can be set at design time. The orientation, vertical or, or horizontal, if you tweak those, you should see it kind of uh, change its, uh, its aspect. Um, minimum value, maximum value, default value, conditions under which it's enabled, and what action to undertake when its value changes. Okay? Um, but more than this, there's a, and, and this is actually due to recent versions of AnyLogic, it wasn't there originally, you'll see there's a, a checkbox that says link to, okay? That allows you to very straight, a, a very, very simple way to, to have it stay synchronized with the value of a parameter, okay? So when you change that, um, you, can, you can have it automatically adjust uh, a value of a corresponding parameter. Okay, so um, what I'd like you to, uh, to do here is, is to go to the general tab. You can also do it in the parameters tab. And for population size, where it used to say 100, where did that 100 come from that it said there, by the way? I mean, just to kind of demystify this, if we look back here, it said population size of 100. Where did this come from? Where did it magically get that value, 100? What? Sorry? Yes. It was in main, in fact. When we set population size, we set default value. So that's where it got that from. If we had set default value of 1,000, it would have been 1,000 there. What we're going to do here instead is for, in an experiment, instead of having 100 as population size, we're going to use, put an expression there. Remember, these are just, they're just expressions that value into values. It could be a value itself, 100, or it could be a, a much more complicated expression. Here we're gonna use a modestly complicated expression. And if it's gonna be slider population size, that's the name of that slider, dot get int value. Okay, that gets the current value of the slider as an, as an integer, okay? Um, so whatever value that slider has as set by the position of that little thing, that slider on it, um, that little uh, element on it, uh, we're gonna use that value for the population size, okay? So in other words, when this, when a person goes and presses this button, it's going to go create the main class with this assumption about exposure and this assumption called population size. And to get the population size, it's going to run this little thing and it's going to get the value of that slider at the current time. Okay? 
Okay, so um, so uh, this is what I for the slider. These are the settings I had. I had minimum value of one, a maximum value of a thousand, and a default value of a hundred. Okay, so the slider we're kind of setting it to go between one on the left hand side and a thousand on the other, and with a default of a hundred. Okay, so. Here we're setting up a little user interface. And if you run the model now, you should see something like that. Okay. Um, and we can pull around this slider, the, the little uh, element on the slider, uh, pull it left, pull it right, and have different assumptions about population size. We can change it as much as we want. The one that will matter is the one that's in place when we press this button. Because it's at that point that it's going to go create the main class. And uh, so if we have it set to a large value, we might get something like that. If we have, by contrast, if we have it set to a very small value, you might get something like that. Okay. So in short, what we've created is a visual way for the user to adjust the population size. Um, now, it's a little bit opaque right now because we don't know the exact population size, but we're going to work on, on making it a little bit clearer. Um, so in short, to be clear here, we have this slider. We put it onto our palette here, and it has some properties. And we set some of these properties up front. In fact, we put some values there during the design time what the maximum value is, the minimum, the default. And, and then when, it's, when this code is running, when, when, the, when, when, when this thing comes up, um, when we press this button, it's going to use this value for the population size. And it's reading that from the slider. So that's, that's actually while well, it's running just before we run the model when we go to press that button. Does that make sense to people? So the slider has some values while the thing is running. It has some general properties we set at design time. And then it has some values um, that we use at, uh, at run time to, uh, to parameterize our model, to, to set the appropriate value for population size. So large, small, we can change those assumptions visually. Um, OK. so. To make this clear, we're going to add some additional controls of sorts, elements of sorts, visually. So one thing we might want to add is, for example, a bit of text to describe what this thing is. After all, if someone sees it right now, they don't even know what that slider is for. So we could go over to presentation, drag some text over, and you could call it text population size or text label population size and give it a text population size. So here we're sort of building up the user interface. This is a particularly static, simplistic component. It's not particularly deep in any way, but it helps give information on what that slider is for. So we're building up a user interface piece by piece, and some of it is more active, like the slider, and some of it is quite static, like um, like this one here. Okay, um, so. Um, we have this, uh, excuse me, um, we have this uh, element there. Um, and then I'd like you to further drag that same type of element, a text, uh, another text, one over to the right of it. Now this one's going to be more textured. This one, instead of just being a fixed label like population size, this one is instead going to be a variable label. A label that's going to change over time. Hmm? It's going to change in response to the slider value. It's going to report the current value of the slider. Okay? So in short, this on the left is a text label that we dragged there and we gave it a fixed title. It's going to stay uh, in perpetuity. Um, and we dragged another text one over there. I called it text slider value. And this one, the text for it, I eliminated here because we're going to be setting it 
we're going to be setting it as the slider value changes. So sometimes we just you know, set the text to be some fixed thing and don't worry about it anymore. Sometimes we're going to be changing the text over time. Okay, so how are we going to set the value for that, for, for what the text is? Well, we've done this before. In fact, we did it just before I flew off to China, we did it. Um, remember, we have dynamic properties associated with things. So here, we have this element here, we have this, if you click on that, this is a text element, it's a text control. And if you go to dynamic, there's a field for it, text. It's a field called text. In that text field, gives you a chance to specify a bit of code, an expression, that computes a value, to use for the text. So we could say slider population size dot get any value. So what does this what does this mean? Can anyone help unpack? So the fact that I'm associating this expression with the text field of this of this text control, what is that what is that doing? What, why do I want to do this? It's going to display the current value that the slider is set. Yeah, exactly. So automatically, it's going to take care of. These are dynamic properties. So every time slider is updated, it's going to take care of adjusting the text that's shown associated with this control. Now we could have had it. We could have had the x and y also depend on that, right? And that could lead to some amusement, um, a certain measure of mirth. Um, as, as we adjust, so if we had had x be this slider population size dot get in value, what would have happened? As oh, we adjust the slider, around. it would move it around. Yeah, it would move this thing around. Here, we're not looking for anything quite so fancy, although you're welcome to pursue your, your, um, your own designs um, in, in secret here. Um, beyond the eye of the professor. Um, but uh, here we're just setting the text because we want the text to be updated, okay? So every time the slider value changes, we want this to update. Okay, so here we're, we've set the text. And so what we should have is something like this when we run it. We should have something where as we adjust this, as we frob, as we say, um, we frob this little slider element, um, it should change the value shown for population size. Okay, so that's going to tell us basically what population size we're selecting with this slider. And population size over on the left-hand side is just a, a static, static element. This, by contrast, is changing. And by moving this around, we can we could change that. And then once we've settled on a population size of our choosing we can go and we can press this button and we'll run the model with that population size. Does that make sense? Okay, so big picture, we have these controls. Some of the controls are very static properties that aren't gonna change, so like the population size label. Others are gonna be interactable directly, like the slider. Others, we're going to set the, their properties when things are running to reflect the, the values of other controls. And, and then when we press some buttons, it's going to start some action, like here, running the model, where the parameters are set according to, according to, these, um, according to these values here. So it's going to run these things to get the current values. You notice 0.5 is just fixed right now, but this is going to um, set the population size according to the slider. Does that make sense to people? Any questions on that? Because we're going to build on this basic. Um, so this is slider population size dot get in value. Yeah. Um, is, is for the population size. That's not too good. I'll have to remember to get the slides up. OK, does that make sense? OK. So a bit of controls here. Um, OK. So. Um, right, so here, the user interface component slider had its value used to set the initial state of the model, the population size. It set it 
on a one-time basis. When it created main, it used the value associated with the slider. Now it's useful. You can set these parameters associated with main. We set them associated with main parameters because the experiment is the thing that creates main. So we can set the parameters. We used to communicate the assumption. Um, and we've seen how user interface components can be used to vary assumptions uh, for the initial state of the model. What we're going to be looking at now is varying assumptions dynamically when the model running. Doesn't make too much sense to do that with population size, because after all, if we lowered it, who would we kill off and so on? It's not really well defined. Who do we, how, would we add people, sort of anonymous people? No, it's okay, but we can vary parameter values. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we shall do next. Um, okay, so um, what I'd like you to do now is to go down main. Go to main, okay? Um, and uh, if, you, if you open up the main screen, you can drag a slider into there. Ladies and gentlemen, where did our previous slider live? Where, where was our previous slider that we were working with just two minutes ago, three minutes ago? Where was that slider? It was in the, yeah, it was in the experiment. Yeah, it was in the experiment. Uh, it happened to be called simulation. Um, here, we're going to be adding this to main. The plot thickens because main is something that we're going to be viewing over time while, while the model runs. And so if we have a slider there, we could potentially adjust that. You know, that button that launches it and that slider, when we launched it, we wouldn't be seeing them anymore. The one associated with the experiment, they're not visible. But main is visible, so we're going to be seeing a slider. Um, and it surrounds in main, so we can use it to, to vary our assumptions. So when you add that slider, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to use it to modify the values of within, within main. So specifically, I want it to say link to exposure hazard. And it's going to have a minimum value of 0 and a maximum value of of 10. This is a hazard. It's a chance per unit time. So it can actually be above 1. Um, not just a chance, which would be a likelihood between 0 and, and 1, but it'd be a chance per unit time. So um, it's because of that per unit time, it can actually be an arbitrarily large, though it can only be a small 0. So the, this slide is going to have a minimum value 0, maximum value of 10, and it's going to link to exposure hazard. What that's, that link to is telling us is to keep the value of the exposure hazard parameter on the one hand and the value in the slider in sync. Okay? So when we adjust, most notably, when we adjust the value of the slider, it will change the value of the parameter. Right? Does this make sense? Okay. Um, That's a good question. By default, it's enabled. Okay. So if we said enabled false there, it will it will be unprobable, improbable. Um, uh, so, but uh, by default, it's true. So it, it's it's not requiring me. If we wanted more more likely though, great question. More likely we wouldn't just say true or false. We'd, we'd have some condition under which it's enabled. Like maybe we only allow it after time 100 or something like that, or after time 20. And we could put in a little condition for that. But uh, for now, we're just going to have it enabled from the start. Okay. So um, a high slider value should lead to a more rapid spread of infection. And a low slider value should, like dropping it to a value of 0, should lead to a stop of spread, no spread at all. Okay, um, so so essentially here we can throttle, we can adjust the the risk of each uh, discord pair having the infection transferred by you know adjacent pair by by um, adjusting that slider value. That slider value will adjust the value of the parameter, and the parameter is used by 
by each person, remember, and the chance of that transition. So here we have parameter, which is really if the nexus of things, the parameter is referred in name, is referred to by the person's state chart, that whole transition that exposes people. Remember, referred to the um, uh, way back, come on. Um, uh, this transition, remember, now refers to this parameter. And that slider's also adjusting that parameter. So it, there's a, um, a thread of logic that now leads from the slider to the, to the parameter and the parameter to the person's behavior. Does that make sense? OK, questions. Questions or help required here? People OK? OK? OK. Um, OK, so um, right, we ran it. And again, by, by, by um, setting it to 0, we could actually stop, uh, stop the attack. OK. Um, so how did people, how did people in this model, how, how did people start getting infected? Seated someone. We seated someone. And yeah, where did we seat them? Where would you put that? It's in Maine. You, you bet it's in Maine. Um, and in fact, it's in the so called startup code for Maine. If you go to Maine and you go to general, and there's a thing called startup code. You basically told the environment, hey, deliver message thing infected to a random person. We did that a long time ago, so it's good you remember. That's great. Um, okay, I'd like you to cut the text for that. Okay, cut it so that it's in the clipboard. Okay, so in other words, Control X you could do, or Command X, or what have you. It, it's it, it, just to be clear, it's environment thought deliberative to random quote infection. Oh, we're gonna take that. And we're gonna put it somewhere else. Okay, we're not gonna have it sent immediately. Okay, boom. Now I'd like you to take a button over. We're gonna add a button. A button's a control also. We've added several controls now. We've added sliders, we've added text boxes, now we're adding buttons, okay? So I'd like you to drag a button over from control, and we're gonna call it button seed new infection, or, or button, you know, um, new infection, or what have you. And, uh, and the action is gonna be the code that used to be in that startup. The action is just gonna tell the environment, hey, send a random person a message. So, so the action associated with the button is going to be the thing that the button does when it's pushed. If by default, it can be enabled, so we don't have to put anything in enabled. Okay. Um, so the action here is going to be that delivered to random. Okay. So now, when you press that button, bing, 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 it should be able to see multiple people around the model. I call it button seed new infection. Um, it's actually helpful to say the type of thing before it because then if you see a bunch of names, you can kind of have an understanding of what different things are. So like slider this, you know, slider infection hazard versus slider population size. You get a sense of, okay, both are sliders, so they're, they're that's the sort of thing they are. So uh, I know if I want a slider, I might refer to them. And then the rest kind of gives what their function is, what their jurisdiction is. Here I call it button seed new infection. It's a little bit immaterial for the purposes of the subsequent slides because we don't refer to it ever. This is just a standalone thing, but but generally good naming helps in remembering things. So so button seed new infection, the action was the code that was previously in the startup for me. Does that make sense? Make sense? Okay. Okay. So action associated with this code is environment dot delivered to random. And when you so what that means is remember this is we're defining sort of behavior of we're specifying the behavior of this button. So when we run the model, when we press that button, the action will occur. We may press it once, we may press it ten times, each time it's gonna run that action, right? Okay. So 
press that button and it'll spread things around here. It may get to places it otherwise wouldn't have gotten to. Um, okay. So that's good. Um, we're gonna we're gonna have some more fun now. Okay. Um, with controls. Okay, so I'd like you, this is again down main. I'd like you to add a variable, okay, from over here. And maybe there should have been a parameter. I probably arguably it should have been a parameter, but I, I'm calling it is reporting enabled. And if you see that is, what what type do you think it is? What sort of variable is it? It's a Boolean, yeah. It's a Boolean. And its initial value is going to be false. It's going to be called is reporting enabled. This is going to throttle as to whether or not we're reporting events while they happen in the model. Maybe we only want to report things at a certain certain time instead of continuously. Okay, so is reporting enabled? Again, probably maybe that should have been a, uh, a parameter. Since then, we could have when we created the model, we could have said what it is. Um, so now, if we go back to person, there's this transition for infection that that reports like I've been infected. Right? And instead, we're going to make it gated. We're going to make it dependent on whether reporting is enabled. So instead of just saying trace ln this has been infected, instead we're going to say if this dot this is a person. I was referring to this person. We're going to get their main reference to their main object, and then we're going to ask is reporting enabled for that. And if so, then we're going to do this trace ln. Okay. So in other words, we're going to have this reporting depend on the value of this variable, the Boolean variable, which lives in me. Does that make sense? So in short, um, we're going to have the behavior of this agent, just like it depended on exposure or hazard, which lived in Maine. Here it's going to depend on uh, whether or not it reports something, this epiphenomenal reporting. It's going to just depend on whether it's reporting enabled. It is the reporting enabled for as reported by the, the main. Okay, questions on this? Does this make sense to people? Okay, remember this is a Boolean variable, and that's good because if inside of these parentheses, this is an expression, it has to evaluate to a what? And you say if, and it has to be a true or false thing, and that's a Boolean. This is either true or false. It's true or false, and that allows if to say, okay, if it's true, then we're going to print this out. If it's not true, we're not going to print that out. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So that's contingent reporting. Um, now, after each of these changes, you might want to go up to model and select it and do build, just because it's going to start. If it has a problem, it's going to identify it in the problems window, okay? Um, and that will let you know sooner if there's a problem rather than just accumulating hidden problems. You don't want the big bang strategy. You make lots of changes and then suddenly nothing works. Um, a whole bunch of errors. Um, you want to see where they come, get them, zap them one at a time. Okay, so um, similarly for the recovery, there's something that just said trace the lead and so and so is recovered. It'll say if reporting enabled in the main is enabled, then we'll, we'll report. Okay. So this is again the expression reference itself as a person. I'm going to get my main, my main object, and I'm going to ask is reporting enabled. Does that make sense? So it's the same basic expression, the exact same if around it. It's just inside of it, it instead of saying has been affected, it says has recovered. Okay? Okay. Um, so now we are going to go back to main. We're go back, back down main. And we're going to we're going to add a checkbox in. So apply it. Text. But next is checkbox. Checkboxes have to do with Boolean things. True or false. So we're going to drag it in. And we're going to have it called checkbox enabled reporting. And it's labeled, it's a sort of visible 
label for it. It's going to be enable reporting. And we're going to have it linked to is reporting enabled. Okay. So in other words, it every time it's pressed, checked, it's going to make sure that is reporting enabled is true. Every time it's not checked, it's going to make sure that is reporting enabled is false. Every time it changes the check state. Does that make sense? I think in return, if um, yeah. Sure. Under is, re is reporting enabled uh, that variable? Yeah. Why wouldn't it let me use a capital F for false? Ah. Because, um, so languages differ. One, so th there's many programming languages out there, and, and they differ in many ways. One of the ways in which they differ is whether they consider um, case as important or not, okay? So we say whether or not something uh, a language is case sensitive. In other words, does it consider um, does it consider uh, capital P person as the same as little p person? Does it consider those to refer to the same thing? Java is case sensitive, so capital F false is not something it recognizes. Lowercase f false is something it does recognize, and it's it's. You could think of it as being extra picky, but it also allows you the flexibility to have um, to use capitalization for very good purposes. So in Java, we for for classes we capitalize the the first letter of it, and and so if I wanted to have a a reference to a person, I might declare a variable called whose type is you know, class. Class capital P person. I might call this variable person, like if it's referring to some particular person. Um, this is referring to the class that represents the push and put, the, the type of this thing, but this is referring to the variable. And when you look at a Java program, you, you come to recognize immediately, okay, this is probably a variable, and this is probably a class. Um, and it's because it doesn't treat them as the same. So by the same token, um, I've got to be careful here because I don't want to say capital F that this is this is not a class, but it doesn't know what that is because it treats it as different than this. And this is the name in Java for the the boolean called false. It, it's not true. In other words, uh, if you had if false, um, you know, uh, da -da -da, else, da da da. Only this guy gets ever executed, right? Because because this is, is not true, so it doesn't do that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so this it just doesn't know what to make of it. Doesn't recognize it. Um, it would I don't know uh, how to uh, how to uh, explain it too much better than that. I I was recently looking for references. Uh, Chris Chris can relate to this, I'm sure. Um, I was recently looking for citation counts to one of my papers, um, and uh, the citation counts were um, uh, somewhat lower than I expected. But then I realized that um, it's because some of the citations had a, 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 a had a hyphen in them, and some did not have the hyphen. And once you took both into account, it was a, a much larger set. But um, it's the same sort of thing. It's like a web of science treats it as different whether or not it has a dash or, or no dash. Um, and um, and so here it's 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 you know it's not treating them um, treating them as the same. Um, there's probably some good example in English like president, um, you know, <laughs> where we capitalize it for mean one thing and not for for other meaning, but I'm not coming up with it right now. My head is still partly in China. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe I could come up with a Chinese example. Um, so this, uh, um, okay, uh, okay. So um, anyway, enable reporting um, here. We added a checkbox, and this was linked to Boolean. Is reporting enabled? So this is a visible element that's going to allow us to adjust this this um, underlying variable called is reporting enabled. Okay, so when we run this thing, the checkbox will be visible up there. And while we're running it right now, at first you should see no output. 
But when you click that checkbox, when you check it, you should start to see start to see reporting here. Start to see output. Oh, okay. Uh, this is is um, it now that by check click uh, by checking it, it is going to turn this true. And by turning to this true, the this thing here, for example, this recovery transition. This if statement is going to be the thing inside here is going to be true, so it's going to it's going to actually execute this little bit of code, which is going to report this um, report something like this. So and so has recovered. Does that make sense? Okay. So in short, we have another type of control, another type of widget, um, which is a checkbox that is associated with Boolean. And we could use it to, to enable things or disable or what have you. Um, so that's um, that's good. Okay, this is just an incidental thing, but you'll notice that uh, uh, that these things are all kind of mushed together here. There's kind of the visual presentation, and it's kind of occurring behind our buttons, which is a little bit disconcerting. So just in case you've ever wondered, how can you clean that up? Well. If you go to main, um, you can move the, um, so when you go to main, what you'll see is there's there's a, a circle and a line. Where, did the, where does this circle and this line come from? You go to main, and you look up in that corner there at the origin, um, you'll see a circle and a line. Where did those come from? It's from, it's from person, and it's because because of what? Like, why is that from person rather than from simulation or from deer or whatever? What is it? What is it about this that makes it care about person? What does main care about person? Why does my main care about person? How does main even know about person? So we have the population. Yeah, it's the population. So it's really, when we, you probably folks don't remember this. Um, it, was, it was many lectures ago now, but when we first dragged person into here, it created population and it also put this visual representation up there. Now, the fact that it would put it up at that check, that sort of crossroads up there, that is, is just its default value. That is basically telling it, okay, um, yes, you starting at that point, left, and, uh, sorry, right and down from there, display the people. That's kind of the origin of, of the visual representation of people. Um, uh, so if we want to change where people are displayed, for example, to move it out of this area visually, we could drag that down to this point. And we could then run it. This is not a particularly deep thing, but it's you know it's kind of nice. So we could kind of have them separated. Now we have our various things up here that we can manipulate, and prob, and, and change uh, over time. And then we um, and then we down here have our, our, our visual representation. Okay. So by moving that around. Um, uh, you could change the, the the origin, as it were, for the visual representation of people. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Good. Um, okay. Right. Um, okay. So uh, I should have had a slide here that is going to transition. We're going to. So what we've been looking at thus far is is uh, controls that are supported by any logic, okay? And they include the slider, the button, the checkbox. We are now going to um, proceed to look at the edit box and the radio buttons, okay? Um, but we're going to do it with a different model where we look at one other sort of, of uh, control. The twist is going to be that the control we're going to additionally look at is not one of those listed here, ladies and gentlemen. It's instead going to be one supported externally by Java 
And I want to show you how you could break out of this kind of um, um, out of this uh, the, the limitations of this. You'll notice file chooser here is disabled except for the professional edition. If you try to add it, I think I think it complains. Um, and and so I want to be able to show you how to have a file chooser because it's a really useful thing to have, and it's really easy to add if you just know a little bit about Java. So we're going to uh, my comments here are going to be fairly straightforward, but they they have significance because they're about they're about bringing in additional elements outside of what any logic normally supports. Okay. Um, okay. So what I'd like you to do here is um, I distributed, um, and I should have had a, a transition slide here. I distributed um, two two times ago, I think three models that showed how to read things in from network files. Do you remember that? And one of them was called hard-coded minimalist network ABM or something like that. Um, I'd actually like you to open up that one, okay? And we're going to basically add these controls to it, to that model, which will include an edit box, protect, include radio buttons, and it will include a file chooser, okay? Uh, being able to choose our own files um, uh, through, a, through a dialog box. Um, okay, so once you've got that model open, hard-coded minimalist network ABM model, I'd like you to add a parameter here, which is going to be called network file path and name, okay? So it's, it's a network file path and name. So it's, it's in other words, um, we're going to have some network file, and we're going to be encoding its so-called path, where you go for it within your computer, and its file. Okay, so this is going to be called parameters. Going to be called network file path and name, and it's a string. Okay, it's a it's it's going to be a sequence of characters. Okay, um, so that's a parameter type. Most parameters we've dealt with thus far are doubles, ints, boolean. This is actually going to be a string. It's going to tell us where to go to find that file, the network file that we're going to be reading. In. Okay. Um, so, so we're adding a, a parameter there. Now, in something that I'm going to explain a little bit more in my in my uh, next uh, next lecture today's session. Um, we're going to be uh, we're going to be using something called an enum here uh, to encode what sort of file it is. Is it a PIEC file or is it a connectivity matrix file? Okay, you can think of this as defining sort of a custom type. Custom in the sense that, in contrast to built-in types like bool like booleans or doubles or ints or characters which have a fixed number of possibilities that are delineated by the Java language. Here we kind of define our own name for, in our, our own names for different values, and we, we give a name for kind of a member of those values. So we can, we can have something called a PIAC, here, PIAC file type, or a connection, connectivity matrix file type, and we can call the set of those things network file type, okay? So you can imagine, you know, if you think about other contexts, this might be male, female, and this might be sex, or this might be ethnicity, and this would be a set of ethnicities, or this might be cities in Maine, right? And you could have a set of cities in Maine, or, or what have you. Um, uh, so basically it allows us to, to define sort of uh, a set of possible name values, and this is in the reference to when you have something of type, network file type, it's got to be one of these, either of these two. Okay? Either you have a PIA file or a connectivity matrix file. That's, that's what we're going to be dealing with. Um, okay, so um, any logic doesn't have a built-in thing to declare any nom. So where you have to put that is you have to go up main, down main, and, and you have to go to advance, and you put in additional class code. And what that's going to say is, within main, it, it's going to know about network file type now. It's going to know it's either a file file, or a file. Note this 
semicolon at the end. Okay. Um, um, the other thing which we're going to have to do in here is we're going to be using some. Uh, in fact, I think this is. Uh, I can't remember if it's in here already or not. In the import section, is there something that already says import Java.io? There is. Okay. Okay. So that's basically saying we're going to kind of bring in a bunch of know-how from um, from from this so-called Java library, Java.io. Okay. Um, so so uh, very good. So. Um, that was there, I guess, already, but and make sure it's in, in yours, but this enum is the most important thing I want to draw attention to. Uh, it turns out enums are really useful, okay? Um, and we'll, we'll see a little bit of the twist. Among other things, if you have a value that's an enum, so let me ask this. If, if there were no enums supported, as it was when I was young, um, how would you encode this? What, what's another way you could encode this? If you didn't have the luxury of giving it a name, what would you encode it as? What could you encode it as? Okay, you could somehow do an array. Um, yeah. Um, how do we commonly encode sex within, um, you know, a SAS file? You might encode it as zero and one. The problem with 0 and 1 is that 0 can mean different things in different contexts. It can mean Alaska, you know, in, in, a, in a dial of states. 0 can mean male um, in, uh, you know, in, in the context of, of sexes. It, it might mean the 0 is income decile in other cases, or what have you. This allows us to give it a name. And more than, you know, very importantly as well, if we have some data within the model, say a, a, a network file type might be an example, maybe it's a sex or an ethnicity or what have you, and we go to print that out, if it were just a number, it would print out as zero or one. Here it'll actually print the name. We'll say, you know, this is a pipe file. This is a connectivity matrix file. It actually knows it knows how to sort of print out a proper name when we have a piece of information like that. And that's useful. It's also useful because we can actually write down in our code PIAC, and it actually knows what that is, it, you know, in terms of, okay, it's a value, it's one of, one of these guys, um, and it prevents us from just assigning it a zero from who knows where. So, so actually, it, being able to name it like that, it turns out to be a useful thing, and we'll see another twist or two about it. Okay, so I'd like you to now create a parameter. that's going to encode the network file type. This is going to be a parameter within our model. And this parameter, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be of type what? We're going to use it to encode what type of network file we're dealing with. What, what type should I associate? Is this a double? It could be a string, OK. But we've actually just introduced It's, it's an other, and it's a network file type, this thing here. Now, now um, here, I could probably do without main dot, uh, but, but um, you can probably just say network file type, but you can't remember why it's main dot, but this is technically true. It's a network file type that lives in main, because we, we defined it in, in main. Um, this is, it was in main that we defined it inside of this. We said network file type. But um, I think uh, you may not need this main dot. It may just be network file type. Um, so that's the type of this. In other words, this parameter holds one of two values. What are the two possible values it can hold? Really this. Pi or, or, or connection matrix type. In other words, this parameter, some parameters hold double, some parameters hold int, some parameters hold strings, some parameter might hold color. This parameter is going to hold a value, one of two possible values, pi and connection matrix. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is going to hold that. Okay, good enough. Um, now, if we go over to simulation, um, to the experiment here, um, 
what we're going to add in, you know, this is this is where um, ooh, ooh, ooh. I forgot to give this to you. Um, okay. uh, maybe you just look at the slides <laughs> from from now on, I, unless you have this on your computer, which you it's probably on your computer. I just forgot to tell you where to where to find it. Um, there's a there's a library called Swing Layout Library. Okay. Um, this is a library that uh, is a Java library. It's, it's very common. You'll find it around. You can download it for free. Um, it's provided with Java. Um, and, and there's a file called the Swing Layout so -and -so dot jar. This is a Java archive. And that basically contains a lot of code to do things. Um, and one of the things that will support is things to choose files. Yeah. OK, Java archive is a, a collection, a bundling up of code in Java. It's, it, I'm going I'm to um, throw out a few terms here, and, and these may not make sense to everyone. But when I take, when I take a Java file, OK, um, call it x.java, OK? And there's actually a bunch of Java files here. If, if we look, watch this, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, so if I go here and I go over to, um, to um, here's this UI hard-coded. If I right-click on main, first of all, let's, let's, let's uh, build this first because you want to make sure this has been built. OK, if I right-click on main and I say open with Java editor, I'll see a main.java, OK? We saw this actually last time. You, you can't edit it, but you may want to, from time to time, peek at it. OK, so there's a, for our, for our model here, this main.java. There's a uh, person.java. There's a simulation.java. OK. Um, so really, your high level description of your any logic model is its state charts and its events. You know, it's various functions um, and so on. Really, behind the scenes, all that gets transferred into, into Java files, right? Now, when you do that so-called build, so we have this bunch of Java. It, it produces a Java file, but it goes a step further. It actually turns these into what are called class files. Okay? Um, and um, a class file, so, so these guys here, these Java files, are like what, what uh, I just pulled up there. So if I, if I right click on this and I say open with Java editor, um, it's a bunch of text, right? Um, it's a bunch of text. That's not a particularly efficient way of encoding it. Um, it's not, if, if it had to interpret that in order to run it every time, it would be doing an awful lot of work just figuring out like, Okay, this is a W and then an H and then an I and L and an E. That must be a a while statement, right? Is that compiling? So this is yeah, this is the this is the compilation part. This is the so-called compiling. I mean, you could call this a uh, sort of source-to-source -source compilation, but but this is the core com compilation. So this goes to a person dot class, and and this goes to a Main dot, uh, dot class. These are the same information that's that's in there by and large in that in that text file in the Java file, but it's um, um, there's some additional information that's joined it, and it's in binary format that's really quick to execute. It basically doesn't have to every time it sees a while statement it says, "What's that, Sonny?" Um, you know, you know, uh, oh, it's a while. W H I L E. Oh, that must be a while. It doesn't have to do that job. Instead, it just knows that's a while, um, and uh, and it, it can execute it very, very quickly. It doesn't have to re-figure out what things are. It just kind of does the work for each one very quickly. There's some additional information, but that's a lot of the gist of it. So these here, I can take my class files and I could give them to you, okay? Um, and I could give them one at a time, and you could run them. And importantly for Java, one of the significant aspects of Java, significant advantages of Java, um, 
is that I could take a class file created on your Linux machine and I could run it on, on a Windows PC or I could run it on you know, an older Mac or whatever. I could run it on, on all these different machines. These files are machine independent. They could be passed around to all different machines. So if I wanted to distribute my simulation model to develop, um, I could give them each of my classes and he could run them, but that's kind of tedious. I have to transfer a bunch of files. Instead, I put them into a jar file. So a jar is just a packaging up of these class files in a way that kind of makes it easy to distribute. And once you have the class, you cannot set the source code in Correct. Short of something called decompilation, right. which is sort of taking this and trying to figure out what might this have looked like to turn into this. It's kind of reverse engineering it. And, and there are tools out there which will do that. You generally run a file of, of, of licensing agreements and so on when you start doing that. But generally speaking, I mean, you can kind of figure out, okay, this, is, this was a while loop, et cetera. But it's an imprecise thing, actually, because certain things might have gotten stripped away. Like it may have realized certain code here can never be reached. Like if you had an if false, it might just totally strip away this thing and, and you know basically just wipe all this out because it knows that this is always going to execute. So it, you're never going to get back the full, you're not going to get back the full thing there typically. But these class files are packaged up and they go into a jar file. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is um, is what, what I was referring to. Whoop, I'm not, mm, okay. Um, that was what I was referring to here. So there's a thing called Swing Layout, which is uh, basically a Java library with some components in it. Um, now, uh, I, uh, I could distribute this uh, to each of you, and I probably should uh, do this, but because um, time is moving on, maybe just pay attention here, and you could see if you could follow this at home after I distribute the file, okay? Um, you could try this one at home. Um, okay, so uh, the next thing you have to do is you have to uh, you have to say, okay, so I have the swing library. I want to use one of the things. I want to use a J, J file chooser. I want to be able to use this component to choose files visually. Okay, um, you notice I'm I'm trying to do away with the need to use this this one from any logic. I'm trying to use a, a general one. So then I added a button that's called select file. You could actually do that if you want. You could add this button, select file. And, and then I added a text, an edit box here, okay? Um, where the, I give the edit box a uh, name. And I added a label for the edit box. It's a static label. It says network in, input file. And then I add some, some code here for the, for the um, button here. So I have a button that says select file. And when it pushes the button, it, it basically creates one of these J file choosers. It opens it up and it shows a window. And I can then go and, and uh, get my file. And if the result of that is that I, I want to go forward with it, basically it will set its path of file. So it will kind of put its its name and where its location is. So let me just show you what that looks like on my screen because uh, it's running here. So uh, run, um, right, um, here we go. Okay, so if I do select file, this will come up with something along those lines and um, I could go, uh, go to my um, classes here and I could go to example models, and um, I could go to um, these things, and I could pick my PIF file, okay? So you'll notice when I did that, it put its, its information here, okay? Now if I, by contrast, if I had done select file, and I gone to that same, um, uh, same thing here, and I had selected instead, um, if I had just done cancel, it wouldn't have done that. And, and that's why there's some code here. Um, I call up the file chooser, I show it, and then if the result says the user approves, in other words, doesn't cancel, 
then set the text for this guy to be what's ever indicated in the current directory from this file chooser appended to whatever the name of the file is that's chosen. Okay? So in other words, I call this file chooser. If the user said OK, I'm going to get the information on what file the user chose, append it to what directory it was in, and set that up here. Okay? So that is going to be set within this box here. And so this is using that file chooser, which is the thing referred to by the um, by, uh, by this guy here. So basically, this thing says, OK, where to go get this library? This thing says, OK, from that library, what thing do I want to actually reference within this, within this class, or which things uh, within that library? And then this is the code to use them. And then I have some, some uh, buttons here. And you could add these if you wanted to. So basically, you have to go over to radio buttons, drag them in. And the radio buttons, you can set a couple choices, many choices, in fact. Um, and so you can type in here, for example, pyat file. And it will have an option for pyat file. You can type in here connectivity matrix file. It will have an option. This is just a name. It, it's, it doesn't know what that means. But it gives the user a label here by which to choose, OK? Um, and you can do as many as you want. Here we're just going to do two of them. So, so here we have a, uh, a label. And if, if the user has chosen this one, it's going to be encoded with a 0. And this one is 1. And if there are more, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So the value of this radio button is to be dictated by which one the user chose. And it starts at 0 and, and rises after that. So now, ladies and gentlemen, I showed some code for this, which called up the file chooser and set the value here if the user said OK. So that's the path to the file. If here I'm choosing what file type it is, if I wanted to communicate that information, the location of the file in main and the type of the file, if I wanted to communicate that to main, how would I do that? Through what? How would I communicate from the experiment to main? We've seen it before, so about 15 minutes ago in the other model. How, do, how would I do that? How do I communicate information from a simulation, from this experiment to me? I do it through parameters. parameters. Yeah. So all I have to do is, is do it through parameters. So I have two parameters within, in fact, we created them earlier, remember? Um, just a few minutes ago. Remember we created this guy and this guy? Network file type. It was, so network path and file name, what was that? It was of type what? It was a the network file path and name was actually a string. string. Network file type, by contrast, was a network file type. It was, a, it was the enum that we created. That could be either a what or a what? A Pyac or a or a connectivity matrix. Yeah. OK, so this is how main is just waiting to be told what, what file to use and what type it is. So now we're in a good position to do that because we have these controls we added here. This tells us where to find our file. This tells us what type it is. So we are going to, for the parameters, have just whatever's in this edit box, whatever's in here, we're going to use for the file path and name. And whatever is here, whatever is selected, we're going to use that particular item from the enum. So if 0 is is used, it's going to use PIA. If one is used, it's going to use connectivity matrix. And it does it by, you actually say main.networkfile type, this is the enum, dot values. That gives you, okay, the first is PIA, the second is connection, connectivity matrix, and you get the value from the radio box, 0, 1, 2. So if this
this is zero, if the zeroth one has been selected, that very first one has been selected, it will use the first in the enum, which is pi. Mm -hmm. If the second one has been selected in the radio buttons, it will use the second one listed in, in the enum, which is connectivity matrix. So in short, visually, if this guy is selected, it will use the first item in the enum. If this guy is selected, it will use the second item in the enum. And if we look back at the how the enum is defined, the very first is pi x and the very second is, is connectivity matrix. So it corresponds, in other words, the ordering of this is the same by design as the ordering of the enum. If we select only the first, it will use the first in the enum, pi x, second one will use connectivity matrix. So this is actually the code to go from the two. This gets all the values in the enum and it picks out the particular one that's selected 0, 1, 2, 3, selected by the radio button. Does that make sense? Other than using parameters? Yeah, uh, yeah there, there are other ways too. Um, they're not going to generally be quite as kind of um, elegant, but um, uh, you could, for example, um, you could have it write out to a file and main could read it in from a file. You could have it, I believe, while it's. You remember that button here? Well, it's, it's some time ago. This button here, when you press it, it does two things. Remember it said run and then set the presentable or something? You could actually have it like directly set variables in main at that point or something like that. Um, so it can, it, so, so let's put it this way, Deval. This, this code here, like these things here, they actually remain, or they're, they're just not visible, but they're still running, I believe you know, at the time main's running. So, so in short, they could still communicate with main, I believe, on an ongoing basis. I'd have to double check that, but I believe that's the case. And how but, does you know. logic go with a pi x file? Is, is that what came in in the job file? Oh. How does any logic actually know? Okay, so that's a good question. So I've simply said here that there are these two network file types, okay? There's a pi x and there's a connectivity matrix. That is a great question. So, so you know, how do I know I didn't say it's a Snuffleupagus file or something like that? Um, I don't know what I'm talking about. But, uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, how do we know there's not a Snuffleupagus file, right? Uh, and, um, uh, like, w why does this mean anything? Okay, so maybe we accept my premise that, that when you select pi x here, that it's going to yield a value in the parameter of pi x. And when you select connectivity matrix in those set of buttons, it's going to yield connectivity matrix. But big whoop de doo like, like where, where does the rubber meet the road, right? OK, so that is a good question. And with your permission, ladies and gentlemen, I will show you where the rubber meets the road. Um, we will see the snuffleupagus. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> that, that, that may be. Um, you'll be fortified. Uh, okay. So this. There we go. There we go. Um, the snuffleupagus is seen. The rubber has met the rug. Okay. So we're in Maine. In the startup code for Maine, this asks, okay, from the parameter, what's my network file type? And this is, by the way, called a switch. I should have covered this as statements before. It'll see, okay, what's my network type? And if it's a pi file, it'll do these things. If it's a connectivity matrix, it'll do these things. If it's neither of those, we want to say, hey, something's screwed up here. I don't know what to, to do with the snuffle up again. Um, so for pi we want to call established network transitions of population from pi network file. If it's a connectivity matrix that we're dealing with, Established network transitions and population from connectivity matrix file. In other words, 
we're going to do different things based on whether it's a pipe file or a connectivity matrix file. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where the rubber meets the road. True or not? True. So, so this, this is where that becomes operational. Before that, it's all, okay, so we have these UIs, and the UI is translated to values, pi actor network connectivity matrix, but this is really where it actually makes a difference. Does that make sense? Yeah, because I see the function. Yeah, and, and those functions were there before. We were just calling them manually. We, we didn't have a good way to sort of figure out which to do. Now the user can actually select. I want a connectivity, this is a connectivity file, this is the file, and it actually goes and find, they can find it on the disk, et cetera. So it's, it, it, it's sort of easier for the user. So. And this, you'll see the code is a bit clearer, because if this had been 0 and 1, like if I said this is called 0 and this is called 1, you know, just use, I wouldn't have really known what it is and been confident it was pi f, but here, here we're sort of going for pi f. Now it turns out this can be done even nicer. I mean, I'm, I've, I've purposefully avoided using advanced features of Java because I want it to be a little bit more understandable. But we could have an array that maps from these things to the corresponding functions to call and just call through the array, and then we'd only need one line here. Um, but but this is just a little bit uh, a little bit more easy to kind of follow the logic, I think. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and because we've named them, we can actually refer in our code to these names, just like we could refer to you know case male, case female, or or a case you know, this state, that state, or this agency, that agency. We can refer to it by name. And the reason it knows those names, how does it know these names here? By, by virtue of what, ladies and gentlemen, did it know those names which have now disappeared? Um, um, so those names, Payek, okay, so there were functions there, um, but uh, um, so, um, Oh, there. How, how does it know? So these are the names of functions. Absolutely. These are the names of functions which were already there, actually. But this pi f, how does it know what that is? I told it in what? What was it? What was the thing by which I told it what a pi f is? Yeah, exactly. And that was an enum. That was an enum. It was by virtue of defining this enum, right? right um, here that I told her what a Payek is. That there is a thing called a Payek. That there is a thing called a connectivity matrix. Absent that, I'd need to encode them as zeros and ones or something like that and it would have been, it would have been kind of mess, messier, right? Because um, uh, I would have said case zero, do this, case one. It wouldn't have been totally clear, is a zero really a Payek or what? Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so I know I, I stretched you a bit there and I have to provide that jar file, but um, the point is what we've seen is a collection of controls here. Uh, we saw uh, early on we saw a, a button, in fact a built-in button in any logic, a, a sort of button that comes automatically. We saw a uh, slider, we saw a text field, both one that was a fixed text and one whose text Dependent on the value of the slide. Slide. Thank you. Um, and uh, and then subsequently we saw a checkbox, right? Um, and then subsequently we saw a radio button, uh, which allowed us to choose among a set of possible values, and um, and we we saw um, as well the um, uh, the uh, edit box, um, edit box here, which can store basically text um, that the user types in. And we, we saw that we can set some properties of these at, at design time, but many of those properties are set, are, are, are most useful at, um, at when, it's, when it's running. So for example, we can ask the edit box, get me your text. And we'll get the text and we can pass that in as the value for the parameter. 
and um, and that value, that parameter, could then you know we could this could be a description of why you're running the scenario. We could put it to a database, or it could be a name to give to the file that will come onto this file, or this scenario, or whatever. So these are ways of sort of passing that information from by getting information from controls. I've also introduced the notion of the nums as an enumeration of possible values, possible legal values, so that you don't have to just encode it in a somewhat cryptic way using doubles or ints or what have you. And we've actually seen here, though this may seem a bit mysterious to you, how you can go from a, a, like number zero and get the corresponding element in this anomaly. So zero here would be pi x, one would be would be um, conductivity matrix five. So that gives us a way to do it. Okay? That makes sense? Okay. Um, and oh, finally, we looked at how we could create a, a custom file chooser from Java's library, but I have to give you the, the file for that. Okay, so that was uh, topic one for today. Um, I'd like to to talk now um, a little bit about types and enums, and then I want to I want to uh, talk a bit uh, more about um, or go with. Okay, so types, as we've seen, tell us the class of values from which a variable is drawn. So when we say person, this variable is a type, capital P person. It says the set of possible legitimate values it can hold is null and then references to particular instances of particular objects of, of class person, right? Um, and we specify types of Java for parameters, for variables, for term values, class fields. Uh, and generally, it tells us sort of what the legal values are to use for something. Um, uh, okay, so um, depending on the type of a variable, you can only do certain things to it. Uh, so a double precision value, for example, can be divided, multiplied, turned into a string. A Boolean can't be multiplied. You can't multiply Boolean. You can't add a Boolean. But you could test it for truthhood. You could turn it into a string. A string could be used. You can't, can't divide a string, but you can use it to, for example, extract prefixes or suffix from it, find its length, concatenate it, etc. So if it knows this is a string, it knows that you can do certain things to it legally. And it'll let you sort of write code this accordingly. An enums value can be turned into a string, converted to an integer, etc. Um, okay, so there's a set of primitive types within Java, booleans, doubles, ints, chars, bytes. Um, and those are built into the language. Um, but most types we use are not primitive types. They're types we define. So for example, person, main, simulation, um, these are all types that, that we've defined. Or they're defined in libraries that someone else has made. Someone else has provided us the class files in a .jar file, for example. For example, color, or um, jfile chooser, something we just, we just saw. So why do we specify types? Um, well, it's like specifying dimensions when in physics, for example. We try to do it to know what we're dealing with, to avoid making silly mistakes. We don't want to confuse a person and a deer, and you know, mount a person on a wall, or you know, um, uh, go um, go you know, try to um, milk a, uh, a moose um, instead of a cow, or something like that. Um, uh, so, you know, we don't want to do something like attempt to divide a number by a person or assign a person to a dollar amount or something like that. Um, absent types, these mistakes wouldn't be identified until our program's running and there's a crash. And generally, having types, they, these errors can be discovered during builds. In other words, when we go to build our code, it will say, this doesn't seem to make sense. And we give up a certain measure of flexibility because of that, but it catches a lot of, lot of mistakes. Um, okay, there's a further thing, though, I wanted to alert you to, which you will see. Um, and uh, we've already seen it to some degree, and I've kind of waved my hands about it. And it's going to hopefully become um, increasingly clear to you over the next few lectures. 
But there's a thing called type coercion of casting. So sometimes we, we have something that's a member of one type. It can be logically treated as or converted to another type. Okay, so suppose we have a double precision value, you want to convert it to an integer by dropping the fractional component. So we have 3.5, we want to turn it into 3. Um, uh, or suppose we have an integer, 1, and we wish to convert it to a string. Mm -hmm. Or suppose that we have an agent, and we know that because we're going through each agent in our population, we know our population is composed of persons, we want to treat that as a person. Mm -hmm. We know it's safe to treat it as a person. When we have this, we can do what's called a type coordinate. We can take a value, say v, um, to bear, it, maybe this is an expression, maybe it's a, it's a value, a variable name, and this is the target type. And when we do this, we have something like that, it'll turn v into the target type, it will try to do this. And if it can't, it will throw an error message. If it can, things are hunky dory, we can just continue with you know, v as rendered by the target type. So we could take, for example, someone's age, which might be an integer, or might be a double. We could turn it to a string, and then we could print it out. right? Um, and if we have an item from our population, we know it's that it refers to a female person. We could cast it to female, and then we could ask, is this female in the pregnant state? Or we could take an age, treat it as an integer, and add one to it. These are all examples of where we are undergoing a type coercion. And I'm glossing over slightly the difference between um, uh, promotion and, and other types of coercion. But fundamentally, we're taking a, a value that's of one type, we're converting it to another type legitimately, and then we're using that resulting value. So the thing that item might be originally refer to just a person, all it knows is it's a person, we're saying, Assume it's, it's a female, and it will actually check to make sure it is female. And if that's possible, what comes out of this is a value that's actually referenced to a, to a female. Um, it's treating that item as a female, and then we can ask that question. Um, similarly, uh, here, what comes out of this is actually a string representing their age. Okay. Um, so. When we cast, for example, all we know is it's an agent from our population. We treat it as a person. It's going to have a reference to this agent here. And what our code, if, if we have code that says, say, person of A dot age or whatever, A may refer initially to this agent. All, all it knows is it's referring to this agent. And we're saying, hey, look, believe me, this is a person. This is a reference to a person. And it's going to double check that. It's going to check it when the code's running. Is this really a person? If it's not, it's going to give us a complaint. If it is, it's going to say, yes, sir, um, this is a person. So now it's going to treat this as a reference to a person. It's going to say, oh, this is a person, OK. Now I, I recognize, oh, it is, it, okay, given that it's a real person, yes, I see, they have an age of 10. And that's going to be the value of this. So um, the coercion here just requires it to double check and then realize, okay, only is this a reference to an agent, it's a reference to, to a person, and so now I can get this extra information on what their age, which in general an agent, you know, you know agents could could be agents for a car, and they don't really have an age or what have you. Um, so type coercion converts from one type to another. And it's basically treating that reference and saying, look, you can double check this, but this is a reference to an x. You, know, um, go, you can go and, um, and get that information by treating it um, as that. OK, um, so any question on type coercion? One other thing that you will see some is that, and this is a very advanced thing, so I don't expect you to, to carry away um, a strong understanding of this, but sometimes we have a type that's defined in terms of another type. Um, so for example, we might have a set of double 
precision values. It's a set, but it's specifically a set of doubles. Okay? Or we could have a dictionary mapping a string to an integer, or an array of strings. Or we might have a pair of a character string and an integer. Okay? So we have this kind of collection, as it were, and that collection could be defined in terms of the types of its elements. And we'll say here the collection is parameterized by, the, by these types. So we have an array of strings. It's parameterized by the type of the thing that it's an array. So you might have something like a set. And we put the type of thing within the set in these, in these brackets. So this is a set of double. Okay? But you could also have, in a very similar fashion, a set of strings or a set of integers, or a set of persons, or a set of deer, or a set of moose. And those, those are all sort of aspects of the same general type of collection set. It's just it's parameterized by this type. So, so um, that tells us sort of more specifically what it contains. Okay. Um, so the reason I'm mentioning this is motivated in significant part because you occasionally see it in the like it. Um, for example, we saw it um, uh, last time, I think, or, or no, two, two times ago, where we had this discrete event modeling. We had these, remember this? What sort of modeling was this? This discrete event, and we had patients flowing through this network and so on. Remember the ophthalmology thing where I think what were they? They were getting fighter jets or something? <laughs> they were, they were I don't remember the exact uh, thing we did, but there were, there were doctors and fighter jets and, um, and so on. And uh, here we, if you went and looked at doctor, what you'll see is that if you look at its type, it says network research pool T extends resource unit or something like that. And all this is saying is this can be any type that that is a, is a subclass of this. And we'll get into what that subclass means later. But basically, it's saying this could be, this network resource pool can hold things of a certain type. Okay. Um, just like you can have a set of, of doubles of here or a set of ints, you could have you could have a resource pool of a number of different types of things or an array list of persons. This is kind of a collection of persons. So, in short, if you ever see this, you should just know, okay, this is, this is a parameterized type. In this case, this is a collection that can contain particular types of items, and it can be uh, different, different types. Um, okay, so enums, we've seen this already uh, in a concrete uh, case. Often we have our model, we, we want our model to encode categorical information. And we can encode this in a classic way using integers. We have a set of possible choices. We could just label them 0, 1, 2, 3. And then we could have, you know, int sex. In other words, there's a variable called sex that's an int, an integer, so 0, 1, 2. In products, right? Um, the problem with it is that we could accidentally, inadvertently assign a sex to a province, for example. Um, and if we saw a 0, we don't know what it is in isolation. Is this, a, is this talked about as zero with respect to province or zero with respect to sex? Um, we could add a sex to a province, which makes no more sense than adding an area to a length. Um, so we make use of what are called enumerations, enums. Um, and, um, and this is really useful. It can, it can spot problems. So enums in Java let us uh, give names to information, refer to the names in our code, like pi f network connection file, convert the names into associated values, compare names, and uh, define, in fact, operations on names. Um, so we could have enum sex, male, female, enum province, these sort of things. Then we could have, we could say, okay, this is some of the sex, this is some of the problems, and this will cause an error. Never the twain shall meet. Mm -hmm. um, they're distinct. And it knows what ML is, what NB is, what PEI is, even though you folks may not. Um, so, for example, here, if you open up this model, ABM model with birth depth, you'll see a bunch of you know, sex, ethnicity um, are defined, and, and then we can use those concepts.
balance that's uh, within within the code. Okay, so we can define these uh, these components. Um, so those are enums give names to things and let us then manipulate uh, manipulate those names and um, we can refer to the names of code. Um, for example, parameters can be associated with enum enums and um, and we could assign them values like male and female, etc. And we could have if statements that depend on this. And this is an example of how we can say assign a random ethnicity. We get a value between zero and the um, number of possible ethnicities, um, minus one, I think, and then we um, return. This is the same type of expression we saw before. This gives us all possible values that this can have. We pick out the i a random number from zero to the length of that we pick out we pick out that element or term. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I think I think I'm gonna drop this uh, discussion right now because I really do want to get on to calibration here. So um, uh, any questions about that material before we finish the class here with calibration? This is gonna be substantive Yeah, do you want to? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, that sounds good. I'll uh, stop the recording and. Ooh.